Kupperman, and I am a comic artist. I took a really circular route into comics. I, uh, I went to school for fine art, um, which in retrospect is one of those decisions that just confuses me. Um, but I just had no idea what was involved in any kind of artistic production. So um, I did that, and then I kind of you know, hung around doing drawings for a couple of years. And then I started doing comics for a, uh, a zine that was being done out of Williamsburg called Hodags and Hodaddies. And uh, it was Xerox with a laminated cover, and you know, it was handed out to all my friends and neighbors. And I started doing stuff for that, and you know, the response I got um, convinced me that maybe this was something I should follow. So, uh, you know, because I liked getting response. So I, uh, I got into it, and then uh, a, a couple of years later, I started doing illustration as well. Oh, I was 25, 26. Yeah, it, it was a little late. I, I might have started doing comics a little earlier, but, yeah, I was in my mid-20s before it really started to solidify. I was, uh, I was a bit of a late bloomer. I had a lot of jobs uh, uh, when I was younger. I worked in an art gallery. I did construction very briefly. I was a waiter very briefly because I was extremely bad at it. I, uh, I, I worked in offices finally. That was what I, I seemed to settle into. And I worked at uh, an artist licensing, licensing place. Uh, and uh, then finally my last job was at Life Magazine, which was kind of a shambles at the time. It was, uh, it was during the... Uh, Gulf War, and uh, that was an interesting experience. I finally begged them to fire me, and that was my last job. Yeah. Well, I first got a Tintin book for a present when I was eight years old, and the stories are, it tells are just so simple and compelling um, that uh, I just fell in love with them, and I read every book, and... Uh, Actually, I translated a couple uh, from French into English that weren't yet translated. I was so fascinated. Um, unfortunately, my French education didn't continue past that. But um, just, he, Hergé created such a compelling, complete world. It was absolutely perfect in every uh, detail. So it wasn't, it wasn't much uh, until a lot later that I knew about his career and about the uh, workshop of, of assistance he had and that he would actually go through the books and update uh, the look of the you know, cars and machinery sometimes, just redo the whole book so that it would stay fresh. And uh, he was just a unique artist. I don't think there's going to be anyone else like him soon. Oh, no, I'm, I'm fascinated by all ephemera from the past, comic books, magazines, children's books. I have a, a large uh, collection of children's annuals at my studio, um, mostly from the 30s through the 50s, but, uh, and, and some extremely bizarre children's books, uh, some that seem more calculated to produce nightmares than uh, not. I love any kind of uh, ephemera that really is alien because it's from the past, if you know what I mean. Uh, something where the attitudes and ideas are so strange to us merely because, you know, we've moved on. What I got from art school mostly was about attitude, um, the attitude you would take towards your work. I don't think I really took anything away in terms of craftsmanship. Um, and I, in fact, didn't attend any illustration or comics classes. So I'm pretty much untrained. Um, and I think in some ways I'm barely competent, you know. Um, I'm not even sure I'm a cartoonist some weeks because I don't have that facility that I think a cartoonist is supposed to have where, you know, as a friend put it, they just do three strokes and it's a tree. I tend to be very obsessive and very rigid and, uh, you know, it, it's in some ways an amateur approach I have going. Uh, I also, I'm of the age so that I, uh, I was educated before computers were everywhere, so that I've had to learn facility with computers and I'm still, you know, only okay. And uh, I think younger artists today, they, they know computers and marketing, and those are two things that I'm just hopeless at. For material, I, I look to the absurd. So I'm looking for, in some ways, the bad 
you know, or the, 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 the material that's a little uh, off-key in some way. Um, there are lots of writers that I enjoy for their excellence, but I wouldn't say they really influence me, you know, in what I do. Um, I love Patricia Highsmith and uh, Philip K. Dick, and, uh, Stanislaw Lem, uh, you know, writers, uh, writers like that. But uh, as far as influencing me as a writer, um, certain kinds of humor, more like that. I'd say my, my, my writing is actually more influenced by other veins of humor, such as uh, television humor, the kind I grew up with, like SCTV or Monty Python, or uh, certain other kinds of printed humor, like I don't know if you know Viz Magazine, but that was a, a bit of an influence. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a tone to it uh, that is just completely beyond you know, any serious consideration of things that I find very appealing. Hobos. Well, well, hobos are kind of a romantic archetype of a way of life that doesn't really exist anymore. You don't hear about people riding the rails so much. I mean, I'm sure there are people doing it, but uh, the whole romantic idea of hobos uh, wandering the country, it's a very Depression-era romantic um, thing, you know, like Little Orphan Annie or something. It came from the idea that uh, someone could put their underpants on their head and uh, that would be a kind of disguise. I did it for the uh, Nickelodeon magazine, actually, which sadly just went out of business. Um, and I did a strip for them and then they waited about a year and a half before printing it. And uh, it didn't seem that enthusiastic for more. Uh, but later they did ask for more, but by then it was too late. <laughs> Sure. Well, um, my idea was to do kind of a one-man humor magazine um, and to try to give a sort of kaleidoscopic feel as if different people were involved um, in different pieces. So the thing about my comics is they're not really that character-based. Uh, I, I don't have that kind of um, character at the center of the action that... Uh, a lot of cartoonists do, and I wish I did, frankly. I think, uh, you know, if I had characters, I could, I could market those. But um, some of my characters that have become best known, like Snake and Bacon, they're really anti-characters. There's nothing you can really do with them beyond having them just be passively repeating the same phrases every, uh, you know, panel or so. As far as other characters in Thrizzle, there's Pegas, who's the uh, half-brother of Jesus and the god of paganism. Uh, he's been a fairly popular one. Um, hmm, who else? Oh, um, the tiny foreplay oh the tiny foreplay robot. That ha he has his fans. The Manister has a lot. Actually, someone um, who I've made friends with on Twitter recently sent me. They had carved a tiny Manister for their dollhouse, and they sent me pictures of it both standing and installed as a banister. For those who don't know, the, uh, the banister is the man who can become a banister, which is uh, useful if someone steals the banister. No, I, I don't have any characters I really identify with. I, I've toyed with the idea of creating a character that, that people could identify with in a different way, a kind of sarcastic everyman. Um, there's an old strip called the... Uh, the Outburst of Everett True, which is from about a hundred years ago or a little more. And uh, it's basically a two-panel setup where someone does something that annoys the main character, who is a stout man, you know, in a hat. And then the second panel is Everett True yells at them and tells them how awful they are. Um, if I was going to do a character that I would identify with, it would probably be something like that. Well, early on I had a, uh, uh, when I was working in these office jobs, I did a character called Mr. Bossman, and that was very much inspired by, you know, working in an office and having a boss. Um, and unfortunately, my boss at the time saw them, and he was not happy at all. In fact, I was fired very shortly afterwards. I had also done a strip called The, uh, what was it? the Incorrigible Saboteur. This is a long time ago. And uh, he called me into his office and he said, I saw that strip and it's, it's about you, I think, because you're sabotaging yourself and you're sabotaging this office. And uh, 
yeah, he, uh, we didn't, we weren't simpatico. But I found, once I lost the job, I found Mr. Bossman so hard to write. I, I just didn't have the kind of, you know, uh, impetus anymore, you know, to write them. Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, right, well, right now we have a baby, so uh, creating the perfect environment for myself is well nigh impossible. Um, but it's, it's also just trying to stay in a frame of mind, you know, where uh, what you're creating is worthwhile. I think that's the, the biggest problem most people have is uh, getting into a state of mind where you feel that creating things, you know, is worth the effort. Um, so that's, that's the tough state of mind to stay in. As far as um, coming up with humorous, you know, observations and material, um, being exhausted all the time, and uh, that, that kind of brings it out, you know, just, uh, just brings out absurdity. It's like Pegasus, I think, one, I thought up one Easter morning when I was just exhausted. And I just woke up and I said, they're celebrating for Pegasus, you know. I, it just came out. And, uh, and there, there you were, you know. So uh, exhaustion, long walks, uh, you know, and trying to stay lighthearted. Those, those are the things I do. There, there is something uh, about sometimes anger can really pull uh, the funny out of you. There's a piece in Snake and Bacon about uh, a, a crazy undertaker, and that was inspired by uh, a, a family controversy about one of my grandparents and how they were going to be buried. Um, and I think I just sat down and that kind of appeared, you know. Um, definitely anger can play a part or inspire you. I don't like just expressing anger, though. That, that doesn't uh, suit my tone, which I think is more detached and ironic. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, anger can definitely fuel humor, but I don't, um, what's the word? I don't put it in the foreground. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I'd say things are in a crisis state right now. Um, publishing is, is obviously collapsing. Um, but for people who do what I do, comics and illustration, that's been happening for a while. I think since 2000, things have been fairly lousy. Um, so, and I, I just think the situation we're all facing right now is that it's easier than ever in human history for people to produce material of any kind, films, writing, um, art, uh, and they can disseminate, disseminate it very easily on the internet. The big question right now is how will people get paid? Um, I think business kind of doesn't want to pay for, you know, things anymore, uh, for, you know, certain kinds of artistic production. So I think we're all kind of facing a, a crisis point right now. Making a living from illustration is, I'd say, just about impossible these days. Uh, and making a living from comics, well, it's not going to be a very good living. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I'm fairly conscious of, uh, of that, of trying to, to be funny in a way that communicates, so that it's not just uh, strangeness, but if, it's, if there's strangeness, it's pointing to something. You know, there's a lot, I, I, I was very influenced by uh, Raw Magazine, which is very design heavy and, uh, you know, used a lot of amazing artists. Chris Ware came out of that, you know, who, who used beautiful design and, uh, you know, or who have very artistic styles. And uh, I made a decision years ago to go more for the, the funny and let the style come afterwards. Well, I think uh, there are some shows on American TV that are incredibly smart, like um, 30 Rock, I think, is very smart. Uh, we enjoy The Office, my wife and I. Uh, South Park, uh, I think, is still very smart. Um, although we don't actually have TV, and every time we're around it, it's just horrifying what it's become. I, I said on Twitter the other day, it's like, uh, an old friend who was always a little flaky, but now they're just a gibbering, crack-addicted, masturbating maniac, you know. 
Um, having said that, we also love Lost, and uh, we have a weakness for uh, reality shows, which uh, you know, we sometimes indulge. We just watched uh, what was it? Scream Queens on VH1. They really know what they're doing with their crappy reality TV. It's just compelling. Um, but then also in England, uh, thanks to the internet now, it's very easy to watch a lot of English stuff. So uh, I've been uh, watching Peep Show, which is great. Uh, the IT Crowd, um, Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle, uh, The Thick of It. There's a lot of really uh, amazing stuff coming out of England. I think they have the lead in verbal wit in uh, you know sarcasm, irony, so on. I think the British are the world leaders, yes. I think uh, Americans are better at the brash and the noisy, um, and that's not always a bad thing. I think South Park, for example, can be very noisy and brash, but when it decides to make a point, they really make their point, you know. Um, they can, you know, really go overboard sometimes, but uh, but I think that's what they do best. Twitter is like um, an odd little kind of petri dish of comedy. And um, I'll, I'll make jokes or I'll throw things out that are kind of deliberately not even finished thoughts or that are suggesting other things because then I know that people will come back with all these great jokes or additions or versions of their own, sometimes better than what I thought of. So it's... It's fun and it's very interactive. I just became a, a father, which is uh, why I'm so exhausted. But um, I really started using Twitter uh, in the month after my son was born because I was staying indoors all the time. I was awake nearly 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, I just felt so isolated. It was just amazing to start talking to these people all over the world and uh, to really feel some sense of connection with them. Well, I, I have plenty of things I'd like to do. Um, as you know, I've learned, uh, it depends who gives you the opportunity. I really would love to do some more animation. Um, you know, I, I would like to do a graphic novel at some point, but I'd also like to go in the other direction and do a book with not so many drawings and maybe no drawings you know, at some point. Uh, yeah. Over the f last few years, and with the help of the internet, I've uh, been able to m become friends with a lot of uh, English comedians, uh, performers, writers, actors, and uh, that's been amazing to me. Um, Peter Serafinowicz, who was in, who did Look Around You, and uh, Graham Linehan, who did the IT Crowd, does the IT Crowd, um, and. Uh, they're doing humor, especially Peter and uh, his partner Robert Popper are doing humor that I feel very close to, is very close to my vein of you know, jokes. Look Around You is an amazing show. It's an educational, uh, mock educational show done in the style, well the first season was done uh, in the style of uh, educational programming of the 70s and the second was done more in the style of the 80s. But uh, it was just bizarre, surrealist uh, humor, a whole show about ghosts, um, and uh, a competition at the end that was uh, for the best song that was judged by uh, Prince Charles, who they digitally laid in from you know, 80s footage. Really amazing. And Graham Linehan, uh, he produced the IT crowd. Uh, sorry, I said that. Graham Lin <laughs> Graham Linehan uh, has uh, produced, directed... Graham Linehan, <laughs> Graham Linehan ha, has uh, written and uh, produced The IT Crowd and Father Ted, both of which are amazingly funny shows. Who are my heroes? Um, well, among, among people I actually know, I, don't, I wouldn't say hero, but I look up a bit to Tony Millionaire, for example, who's a little bit older than me and I think is, is just one of the most amazing artists. Around uh, truly a classic version of a cartoonist. Um, as far as heroes from the past, I, I don't know. It's 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 tough to say because I feel like we're living in such a different landscape now, and um, I feel like people judge themselves by the yardstick of the past all the time. It's just not possible anymore. Um, 
when you when you look past at the lives that these people led, they're just so outlandish. I mean, I'm thinking of the big strip cartoonists who were very popular in the 30s, 40s, 50s and lived these huge outlandish lives full of color and event. And uh, that's just not the same anymore. Well, I think we really are in a different version of life now. We're living a different version of uh, what it means to relate to each other and be human. Um, and, and art is judged by very different uh, standards of what it used to be. I do think it's strange because the technology keeps improving and yet um, what can be done with it keeps degrading. Um, it, for an example, in print, uh, if you look at magazines from the past, the printing and the production is just immaculate. And uh, magazines today, even the best of them, can't match that. Uh, you know, animated cartoons, very similar. I think the production in the 30s and 40s is just incredibly beautiful. And with the exception of Pixar now, I, I'm not seeing anything that's that powerful. I think we're in a, a funny time now. We're in a, a kind of shift. The new technology has really affected the way people uh, see the world and relate to each other. And so I think we're in transition. Um, I, I would think that very few people like the way things are now, but maybe I'm just projecting. Um, I think what what needs to happen is an examination of why people exist. Is it really just to work? You know, is is working for someone else your whole life the sum of what there is? I think um, these are questions people are going to be asking more and more often since no one will be paid uh, that well anymore. I think there is a crisis of the creative class. I mean, among people I know in the theater and all kinds of arts, um, the funding is gone, the money is gone, and the spirit is not so strong, you know. Um, it's, it's very hard for people to, to keep wanting to produce material when they don't feel like the audience is there or there's any reward at all. I think it would be Groucho Marx. Yeah. I'd love to meet him, although I, I, I know he could be quite prickly and difficult and even abusive. I would still like to have dinner with him. The worst career advice I ever got was to drop the pseudonym I was using, P. Reves, and just use my real name. Uh, I severely regret taking that advice. I wish I'd kept that pseudonym, but I think it's too late now. Oh, of course, yeah, if, if the opportunity arose or if it seemed like a good idea, yes. Oh, there have been so many career mistakes in my career. Sometimes it seems like it's nothing but. Um, I would say going into comics at all is a profound mistake, and anything that follows that is just compounding it. But, you know, now I'm stuck with it. As they say in The Godfather, this is the life I chose. Well, when I was younger, we, I, we lived in England, and then we moved back here, and I had an accent for several years. That uh, wasn't, you know, the best. But as far as, I think the biggest obstacle I have to overcome is being tall. It, it makes you very visible, and you have to compensate a lot for that. My, my advice to any young, aspiring cartoonist would be to uh, gain some other skills, you know, to have some other things you can uh, fall back on or rely for income. Um, but again, any younger artist is probably going to know, you know computers and marketing which are the, really the two things you need to know. I think cartoons are the comics and cartoons are the sister art of film. They developed uh, at approximately you know, the same time and uh, moved through the first half of the 20th century um, in kind of similar fashion. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to start one more time. Okay. <clears throat> Cartoons and comics are important um, for, for two kind of opposite reasons. I think for reading material, uh, they're very compelling. They're a marriage of the visual and the narrative. And um, in, in my work, what I hope to achieve is, uh, is uh, art that 
takes you outside of the, your normal perception of, uh, of society, of reading, of power relationships. It takes you outside of normalcy. Uh, but cartoons and comics started as the sister art of uh, film, and um, for a while there, I think in the 40s, they were actually leading. The, the comics like Dick Tracy, the comic strips, would be, uh, I think, more shocking and more dynamic than most films being made at the time. And so for a while, I think comics were actually leading the culture. Now they're in more of a follower status. They're, they're following film, they're following you know, personality and celebrity and so on. But I think uh, comics are important also because, uh, I mean, to me, part of the attraction was you could do a drawing on a page, uh, reproduce it you know, at the time for five cents a page, and just hand it out. It's one of the most democratic art forms there is. All you need is a pen and a piece of paper, you know, and you're in business. Um, no, I think uh, political cartoons, at least in this country, are kind of a mess. I'm still seeing, um, there are still cartoons working in uh, England who I think are doing interesting work in that vein because they're allowed to be as venomous as they like. In America, all I see is either this kind of wishy-washy, you know, joke-making thing, or else it's someone whose venom has taken over their brain, and they're no longer capable of, of making a coherent cartoon. Um, you don't have cartoonists anymore like Thomas Nast. I think that's, that's really a specific period in history. And he was exceptionally vicious uh, in a lot of ways. I, I think uh, Horace Greeley, the the uh, presidential candidate, he, he kind of killed him, you know, he drove him to a sick bed and then shortly after that he died. You know, Twain, I mean, uh, Nast could just be an extraordinarily vicious guy and just really go after people. And, and no publication now here is really going to encourage that. Yeah, I think, I think every publication is terrified of being sued to a ridiculous degree. They, they really are. They, and what's sad is that I don't think the people in magazines even have a knowledge of the First Amendment. You know, they don't even know what they could be sued for. So they just avoid anything that has the appearance of potentially inviting a lawsuit. It's extraordinarily weak behavior.